Hey everybody, happy Wednesday, or as we say in the States, happy hump day. We're in the middle of the week and then we're gonna cruise on into the weekend. Holy schmamolies, it's hot in Los Angeles today. I've been like sweating for, I don't even know, like three hours. <sighs> Luckily I have a new water bottle, so that's helping. Um. Anyway, so when it's Wednesdays, if any of you are new, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. I put out videos five days a week, um, and if you have any questions that you want to be asked, um, Tuesdays I'm on Tumblr, Wednesdays I'm on the website and YouTube, Thursdays I'm on Twitter, and Friday I'm on Facebook. So you can ask your questions on the day that fits with the, or the place that fits with the day. Wow. Um, and then maybe get it answered, so you don't want to miss that. And I have a journal topic today, so I have four questions, so let's get crack a -lacking. Okay, first question. Hey Katie, can binge eating be a form of self-harm? I find myself eating even after I'm full and thinking that I deserve to be unhealthy. Any thoughts on that? Thank you. I thought this was a good question because I know many of us um, struggle with binge eating and oftentimes I find in eating disorder worlds and in like treatment centers, they focus so much on anorexia and bulimia and people with EDNOS and with binge eating disorder sometimes feel like things aren't quite catered to them. People don't talk about it enough. And binge eating is just a series and now in the DSM-5 it is um, its own category, it's its own diagnosis, which yay, we're making progress, we're moving forward. Um, but okay, so there are a couple pieces to this answer. So yes, to answer it directly and succinctly, yes, I think binge eating can be a form of self-harm just the same way that I feel under eating or um, you know, cutting yourself, banging your head against the wall, any kind of things can be self-harm because it depends on the way we think about it. So binge eating can be an eating disorder. It is a way to cope. It's something that we do when we feel really stressed out or if we're just feeling anxious. Sometimes we might not even know why we're doing it, but we won't have the thought process that the person in this question says they have where they say, you know, after I'll even keep eating after I'm full thinking that I deserve to be unhealthy. A person with, person with an eating disorder, if it's just an eating disorder and it's not a form of self-harm in that direct of a correlation, obviously we know when we struggle with eating disorder, whether it's overeating or undereating, it's actually harming ourselves. But to do it specifically for that purpose is what makes this a form of self-harm. Does that make sense? I know sometimes it's kind of hard to distinguish, but the difference being that we actually have the thought process of, I deserve this pain or I need to, you know, I um, deserve to be unhealthy. If we have that link in our brain, we actually think that, then yes, it can be a form of self-harm, okay? And if any of you have experience with this and want to share, let us know below, okay? Question number two. Hey, Katie, before entering college, I had a mindset that I would never be part of Greek life on campus. Me too. I only had knowledge about the stereotypes portrayed in the media. When I was on campus, a few of my friends convinced me to go through recruitment. Every idea I had about Greek life, Greek life was corrected, and I realized that it was for me. I joined a sorority that fall. I don't regret it, and I love every minute of, of it. If I remember correctly, you were in a sorority during college as well. What would you tell someone who was questioning joining a sorority or fraternity in college? Do you think that they can silence or support a member who is suffering from a mental illness? And I decided to pick this question because... I'll share a little bit about myself. I don't often do that, but this is kind of a question I can give you my own experience and I can tell you why I honestly, I don't think sororities and fraternities are for everyone. I think that it depends on the school and it depends on the sorority or fraternity because any of you who've ever joined Greek life or gone through recruitment, you know that each group is different and a lot of them have stereotypes of their own, which some can be true, some cannot be true. I mean, at Pepperdine, which was a Christian school that I went to, some were known as like the goody-goody girls, some were known as like um, extreme church-going go girls, some were the party girls, some were the rich girl. I mean, and to some extent, a lot of the people in those groups tended to be, you know, that of that type. The way that I picked it was based on the people in it and who I clicked with most. So, but... That's how I picked it, and I think that's the most important thing for anybody thinking about it is to make sure that you actually click with the people and enjoy it and want to do things because the reason that sorority life and fraternity life can be so great is that it really gets you involved with, or at least for me, with activities on campus, with community service in the area where you're going to school. I thought it was great to help me meet new people, make friends, um, just get involved in Pepperdine life, so I loved it. And... As far as silence or support members who are suffering from mental illnesses, in my experience, 
our, my sorority, I was a Kappa Alpha Theta at Pepperdine, and I still am. I'm a member of the alum. Um, we had, I'm not going to name any people, but we had two people who had to go into inpatient for an eating disorder. Um, we had many girls suffering with depression, and overall, I would say, obviously from the outside, but they were friends of mine, I felt like we really supported them. We sent them get care packages, we called them, we sent them letters, um, we were there to support and help guide to find the right kind of help. Um, and there are a lot of things offered through fraternity and sorority organizations to help their members. So I think that it, now there's a lot of support and the people in it obviously are the ones that would start that. But I think even in the future, we could, as a Theta, as a member of the alum and getting more involved in the alumni organization, I think it could be a really cool way to connect people with proper help. Who's to say you can't go on capalphatheta.com or .org, I think is what it is, and find a therapist in your area or, you know, connect with someone who is struggling too and maybe you can message or I don't know. I don't know, but those are just thoughts that I have. So I think it could be really great, okay? Question number three. Hey, Katie, thank you for all of your great videos and de dedication to uh, your followers. I've recently started therapy for years of what I now understand as trauma. I've been completely disconnected from my emotions, and going to my therapy session brings up tremendous anxiety for me, as it normally does. I suspect because I know I'm getting closer to the emotions every time I go. I feel quite safe with my therapist. However, I can't fight the feeling like I want to hide or be invisible when I'm there. Would it be appropriate if, to ask if I could bring comfort items with me to my sessions, like a cup of tea and a blanket? I want to keep going, but the desire to be invisible is getting in the way of me being able to speak much, be able to speak much at all. That is completely fine. I personally keep blankets in my office. Um, I don't offer tea, but maybe I should. But I think that's completely reasonable. That's not bizarre at all. A lot of therapists, and I actually had this teacher in school when she was teaching us about this. They talk about even having transitional objects. Like when you're finishing therapy, some therapists will give you like a little token gift um, to help you remember the work you've done together. I know I've talked about terminating therapy and I talk about talking um, with the therapist discussing all the work you've done as you move through and some people give transitional objects and those are supposed to be kind of like comfort objects to take with you now there's nothing to say you can't bring it into session to make you feel more comfortable i used to tell my eating disorder clients when they get out of treatment to always wear comfy cozy clothes that you feel good about you can curl up on the couch you can get comfortable because many of my clients were struggling with you know body image issues already and there's nothing wrong with bringing a blanket and just being comfortable whatever makes you feel secure um i think that's a great idea so i'm glad you brought it up that's why i wanted to bring up this question because it's something i kind of talk about with clients and i make sure that they're comfortable and I, you know, I've let them bring blankets or journals or whatever. They can take notes while they're talking to me. Um, I think it's a great idea. So if any of you are thinking about doing it, go for it. Okay. Question number four. Hey, Katie, is it normal to feel physically exhausted after therapy, after a therapy session? What can you do to cope with a particularly intense session? Yes, it's totally normal. Emotions. And I, this is something people don't give enough credit to using our brains in an intense manner, whether, whether we're studying, whether we're processing through something and working in therapy, whatever it may be, or working through a really hard problem maybe, um, can be so exhausting. And for those of us who are worried that we're, you know, oh, it's too many calories in our treatment team and my dietitian's adding all these things on, our brain uses a lot of energy. It needs a lot of energy. There is no time I'm more hungry slash exhausted than when I've been studying all day. So when we're doing a lot of work, and when I used to work in therapy um, processing the death of my father, that was exhausting because I cried most of the time. I'm a crier. You guys know that. So it's totally normal. That's completely normal. Now, the way that I would cope with it is, first of all, allow yourself to be tired. We don't have to run and keep going 120% in our life when we're working through something. That that's really hard. So I would encourage you to give yourself time to be tired. I used to do my therapy sessions at the end of my day when I knew that then I could just go home and maybe veg out, maybe I'll watch TV, maybe I'll journal. I would plan out your evening so that you feel like you can be however you need to be. I wouldn't make a bunch of plans. I wouldn't have a huge to-do list. I would make that day your self-care day 
Maybe you put your feet up, maybe you go get a manicure. Maybe you just sit at home and do nothing. Sometimes I enjoy just like this, spacing out in silence because I have to kind of, you know, decom or not, I don't even, decompress, I guess is the best way I can say it, okay? Journal topic from Rachel, thanks Rachel. Hey, she caught me perfect timing on the chat room. If you're on Katie, if you haven't gotten on katiemorton.com, we have a chat room. And so she gave me this wonderful quote. Some days life is all about your dreams, hopes, and visions for the future. But there are some days where life is just about putting one foot in front of the other. And that's okay. And I really like this because I, I do a lot in my daily life. And I have all these dreams for what we're going to become as a community and what I want to do. And, um, but some days I'm tired and some days it's hard. And some days are just shitty days. And you just need to put one foot in front of the other and keep going and get through it, Right? And she says, I love this quote. I think it's so important to believe regardless of what you are in recovery for. Recovery is so difficult and putting a tremendous amount of added pressure on yourself will just end up being detrimental. I agree. Remember, sometimes you're going to feel motivated and happy and inspired to keep fighting. But when you do have those thoughts, you don't want to get out of bed or you don't, or you want to starve yourself or self-harm. Just remember that it's all okay, just as long as you continue to fight. So I would encourage all of you to replay that little bit write down that quote and write what it means to you. And, you know, maybe if you're having a shitty day, just remember, put one foot in front of the other. We're in it together, right? Okay, so tomorrow is Thursday. Hurry, and I'll be on Twitter. So ask your questions there using the hashtag KDFAQ, and I'll see you then. Okay, bye!